Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Sackler, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, I'd like to wish you happy holidays and happy Hanukkah. Um, the programs that we have, the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art that we have here in the auditorium are an extension of the center. And we use the auditorium when we know we have special programming that's going to draw a lot of people or requires uh, a good view. And the screening that we're going to see today uh, deserves this auditorium and many, many more. Um, we've had an incredible two and a half years since the center opened. Uh, come March, it will be our third anniversary. We're an exhibition space. Many of you know us as an education facility dedicated to feminist art. And our mission is to raise the awareness, public's awareness, of the contributions of feminism and feminist art to our entire landscape, our political landscape, our artistic landscape, and our uh, social and cultural landscapes. Um, today is a special day. It's the, uh, I can't remember if it's the third or fourth of this year. It's the third uh, wild card. Uh, and most people don't know what it is or care what it is. I care what it is because part of my agreement with the museum in putting the center together was my request and their agreement to give me three days a year or four, if it merited it, to bring in guests that I felt were particularly important that aren't necessarily um, connected, if you will, to the museum world. Uh, so it gives me an opportunity to bring in people associated with women's struggles and activism, with women's rights and politics. And we've had uh, uh, panel discussions from funding a revolution to the war that we have to uh, wage on the uh, global international sex trafficking uh, problems. Our guests have uh, included the great and wonderful um, Gloria Steinem, Jennifer Buffett, Carol Jenkins, Lowry Sims, and many more. Uh, and it's always wonderful and an exciting opportunity um, to hear some very important people. Today, we are screening the award-winning documentary, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, which was produced by my good friend, Abby Disney, and directed by the very talented Ginny Redeker. And we will follow the screening of Pray the Devil Back to Hell uh, with a discussion. Uh, it is an absolutely extraordinary story of a small group of Liberian women whose peaceful protests in 2003 against and amidst a very bloody civil war took on the violent warlords and corrupt Charles Taylor regime. And they won a long-awaited peace. They took their country back. We talk about taking back the night. They took back their country. They ended the horrors of war where children and women were the primary targets and the victims of this uh, horrendous period of time. Today's screening has been coordinated with UNIFEM, the United Nations International Fund for Women, at work since 1976. And I would like to introduce you to the president of the Metropolitan New York chapter of the US National Committee for UNIFEM and vice president of the National Board, Leslie Wright. And Leslie is the reason that we are here today uh, about to experience this moving and inspirational film. Uh, Uni UNIFEM is distributing Pray the Devil Back to Hell. And at my invitation, uh, for a wild card, uh, Leslie met it with great enthusiasm to have uh, Pray the Devil Back to Heaven, to Hell, Heaven, Hell, here. Let's put the devil in heaven. Maybe we'll have a changed world. Maybe that's my dream. Leslie believes, as do I, in empowering women to make a difference in the world as we know it and Leslie believes that the world as we know it might be changed by this film. So please help me welcome uh, Leslie Wright. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Sackler. And I would like to thank both Dr. Sackler and Ginny Redeker for being here today um, to be able to screen this film with us because this, the film itself um, almost needs no introduction at this point in time. 
The U.S. National Committee took on the project with many other nonprofit organizations of getting the word out about the film and of doing screenings all over the country. And in our case, we had all 12 of our national chapters screen the film in their communities. And in the case of North Carolina and New York, there have been at least 20 screenings of the film that have taken place. That means that the word has gotten out about the story of the Liberian women, a story that would have been left untold had it not been for the work of Ginny and Abby Disney really being committed to making certain that this story was researched, put together as a documentary film, and distributed widely for all of us to um, get some inspiration from. When you see it, you'll see what I mean. Now, the U.S. National Committee, as I said, has 12 chapters. The Metropolitan New York chapter meets in the New York City community. We have several more screenings that we hope to be able to do of this film in Queens and, in, and on Long Island. And we hope that it, for those persons that you know who would be interested in those films, that you would tell them about us. Um, we have a website. Um, you can find our website listed on the brochures that are out on the table in the back. There's also a sign-up sheet there if you would like to participate in any of our additional programs. We hope to have a fundraising event uh, where we have invited um, Gillian Sorensen and her husband Ted Sorensen to speak about politics in the United States and how it affects women. Um, we hope that that will take place the end of January. In March, we do our luncheon, um, which is where I met Abby Disney, actually. I invited her to speak at our luncheon, and she was so moving and inspirational that I knew that even before the film was completed that we wanted to be part of the group that really pushed to have it exposed widely in the United States. Um, then, in addition to that, we'll be doing a conference in June on violence against women. That's June 11th and 12th, and I do invite you to put your names on the sign-up sheet if you'd like further information about any of these programs. Thank you so much, and without further ado, I'd really like to um, invite Dr. Sackler back to the podium to kick off this film, and I do look forward so much to the talk back with Ginny Redeker. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Leslie. Um, it's wonderful that UNIFEM is doing the work that it's doing. It's wonderful that they're here with us um, to see and screen uh, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. So if we could lower the lights and um, enjoy. I think you're in for a, a wonderful treat. Fabulous. It's just so uplifting. This is Ginny Redeker, the director of Pray the Devil Back to Hell. It's, it's just incredibly fabulous. Every time I see it, it just gets better and better. Um, as you know, we had promised a conversation with Ginny and myself and with Abby Disney. Abby called last night and she's had an emergency with her family, so she's unable to join us today. But we are going to sit down, Ginny and I, and talk. Uh, and the women are incredible. So I'm curious to know from you uh, how you got involved, what you found when you were in Liberia, and how, these are three questions, how you determined, how you, as a filmmaker, uh, sculpted this story so that we we have the full gist <laughs> of it. Well, I, I got involved because of Abby, and Abby had gone to Liberia. She's been a philanthropist and been involved with women's movement, movement for many years. And she went to Liberia um, after Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was elected to support her presidency. And while she was there, she heard all these women talking about, oh, remember the day that we were in the field, or remember the day that we confronted Taylor, or remember the day that we surrounded the Peace Hall? And Abby kept saying, what are you talking about? You know, Because somehow the story was not heard, and Abby figured, well, if she didn't hear about it, she didn't, it couldn't possibly be true. And coincidentally, Abby and I ran into each other after not having seen each other for like 12 years um, at our daughter's softball game. Um, and I had been making documentary films covering many different issues um, for a long time. And Abby said, I think I heard that, I, I think there's an incredible story about what happened in Liberia. And I had actually the, the same initial response that Abby did, which is this couldn't possibly be true because I actually have made other films in Africa. I knew a lot about what had happened in Liberia. 
And Abby said, well, would I make this film with her? And I was quite concerned because when you make a documentary film, you really live it, you breathe it, that's all you think about. And everything I'd heard was really about you know, how many women had been raped and the brutality of it and the children having their limbs cut off. And I thought, I don't know if I could do this. And then... Before you continue, will you hold that? Because I would like to read your bio. Oh, oh So okay. that everybody can fully... I got so carried away with the film wanting to hear from you, but I, I think you'd like to know a little bit so, so, we can, okay. so everybody will know. You are one of the world's leading filmmakers on women's issues. She produced Asylum, the 2004 Academy Award-nominated uh, short focusing on the story of Ghanaian women who fled female genital mutilation to seek political asylum in the U.S., and was the producer-director of the 1994 Sundance award-winning Heart of the Matter, the full, first full-length documentary about the impact of HIV on women in the U.S. She produced and directed the 2005 Emmy award-winning documentary Ladies First for the PBS series Wide Angle, which focuses on the role of women in rebuilding the post-genocide Rwanda. For Wide Angle, she also directed The Class of 2006, which spotlights the first uh, 50 women in Morocco to graduate from an Imam Academy in Rabat. And there are many other credits, many uh, Emmy nominations, and um, you, oh, Michael Moore, Roger and me, that's where you started uh, in film as, a, as an editor. Um, and p with PBS, a lot of things. So we'll talk about that later. But you are, you were coming to this, and you, Abby, you and Abby did get together, and Abby knew right. that you had all of this yes, grit right. behind you. Because Abby had actually hosted a, uh, a fundraising party for me for one of my first films. Okay. Um, but I, w I, I was nervous until Lima came to speak to United Nations. I, th I think actually at the invitation of Unifem to speak um, about the importance of women in peace and security, and. Um, we met Lima at that point. And when I met Lima, I thought, oh, there's no problem. We definitely have a film. Because I realized, it was, as you said, it wasn't just a film that was horribly depressing, but that it was a um, wonderfully inspiring story. And um, so that was kind of where we started. But we really had to document that the story was true. So the first thing that we did is we went and we did a um, fact-finding trip mm. where we went, I think, in December of 2006. And we got about 20 or 30 of the women who had been involved um, to come and meet with us. I mean, we invited everybody who wanted to, to come and talk to us. And we sat around for hours listening to women's stories. And we also shot that, um, not with like professional cameras or whatever, but to document. And it was just one of the most emotional days of my life because these women were telling incredible stories where one of them left off, the other one would start. And I felt incredibly responsible um, to, to really do the best job I could in conveying their stories. And at that point, I really made a commitment that I would not use a narrator, I would, there would be no voice of God, that I would let these women speak in their own voice and tell their own story. And um, that was what we did. So since you weren't in real time, but you were reconstructing the events, how did you get all of this footage and this so the, 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 fir the, the first thing I did is actually, we took from that first meeting, I, and then I put all the women's stories in a chronological order. Um, and there are certain events that everybody always talks about, and no matter what you do. Um, and I knew those events to be true, and I got as, my hands on as many other documents that I could and started searching through footage. And one of the things that was interesting about it was it was incredibly easy, actually, to find the war footage. I have to say that I probably spent in an edit room, I think, at least three weeks straight, um, you know, say 40 hours a week, looking at horrible images of what boys with guns and men with guns were doing. Um, but it was incredibly difficult to find the footage of the women. That was a really hard material to find. That, that's something we've become accustomed to hearing over and over and over again. Uh -huh. That's one of the things that I think your film is beginning to address, as we try to address here at the center. What I n notice, and is particularly stunning, are the young ages of the boys yeah. in this. And it, it seems as though, and in the very beginning, it talks about what it is to capture boys at a certain age, pubescent, prepubescent, when a lot of hormones are going and things are going, and to really bring them into a uh, mindset is, and did you meet any of the surviving boys? 
Well, the last scene is with the, those, the guys who are talking about, you know, that they disarmed to the women. The, they had been child soldiers. Um, and, uh, um, I mean, there was kids as young as six that were, had guns. I mean, some of the women tell stories of having a six-year-old boy who can't even hold the gun, so he's sitting on the ground and holding it and pointing at you and ordering you what to do. Um, you know, just incredibly dangerous. And these kids were, were drugged and, uh, you know, fed drugs and... Um, but what, again, what was, what was interesting is that there was, I had journalists say to me, I saw the women on the field, but I thought they were so pathetic looking that I didn't film them. So that, you know, it was much, and, and that when we stayed in Li Liberia, we stayed at this hotel that had stayed open the whole time during the whole war, and the hotel was, had, was the lobby was like decorated with cartoons of young boys with guns posing for journalists. So in some ways the boys would play to the journalists, um, and mm -hmm. that the women's story was right there, and, they, and people missed why it. Do you, why do you think that? Why do you think the, that you didn't know about the women's story, or Abby didn't hear about it, or we didn't hear about it? I think, I think two things. One is that um, this was happening exactly at the same point that we were, this country was involved in invading Iraq, exactly that point. Um, and I think that war is told from the point of view of people with guns and, what's, and what controls it. And yet any general, anybody will tell you that, that um, the hearts and minds of the population are the most important thing. I mean, I think that we're going to watch how this unfolds now in Afghanistan. Um, all the stories about what's happening with the guns and the surge, but what's going to happen with the civilians? I, I mean, I'm really curious about that. What are the women in Afghanistan going to do? Right. So I think it's a story that people don't often follow. And what kind of distribution will this film be getting internationally? Maybe that's a Unifem question, but I'm just curious to know whether or not we're going to the other women are going to have an opportunity to see this. Um, the film has already played on all seven continents. Um, we've we've been playing in uh, we've played in conflict zones um, with Unifem. We're doing distribution with. Um, Oxfam has asked if they can distribute the film in conflict zones mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, we've, a Abby and I have taken it personally to places like Israel and Palestine, and it's been in Iraq. It's been shown in places in Afghanistan, in Sudan, um, in Bosnia, uh, in Georgia before the war started, and it's often had an incredible impact, and, and women have come together and started working together. And often women say, wow, I recognize this as my story. In the United States, we're gonna, um, we are going to be on WNET and Channel 13 as part of the Wide Angle series. And because of this and, and what's come out of this is that actually we're now going to do a four-part series, well, five parts because this will be the first, um, about women, war, and peace on a global level because we feel that what we saw both in the fact that we, there wasn't footage of it, that there wasn't coverage of this kind of story, and also that a lot of the elements of what we saw in the, this film, that, that war being the purpose of the war, not to win the war, but to keep the war going, civilians being under attack, rape being used as a, uh, a tool of war, a strategy of war, the same things we're seeing happening on a global level. I had an opportunity a couple of months ago to host uh, at the foundation a fundraiser for Women, War, and Peace uh, for Wide Angle for WNET. I know you're hoping to start production in January yes. with the year's start date. And just so everybody knows, I don't know if there's any place online. It seems like everything's online. But I think uh, WNET is still uh, continuing to look for sponsorship. And I had suggested to them that it would be a wonderful thing to have women's organizations, national women's organizations, and local women's organizations in this country band together and make contributions towards women, war, and peace. So that when you have the credits rolling at the end, you have a very nice, long solidarity um, having to do with that. I have a question for you. Uh, there are two things that, that are in my mind. One is about women, war, and peace. And I am um, curious to know the punctuation of women comma, war, comma, and peace, or women, comma, war and peace, or yes. how is it going? Women, but war, no commas, and peace, ampersand, and peace. Um, uh -huh. so, so, it's, so that's the way, it's, yeah. so, so with that, how, what, describe to me precisely then what, how that will manifest itself in the four parts. Well, I think actually we're still determining that because what we had decided was to not, be, to, to decide exactly what the stories were until we went into production because things change. Yes. But we'll really be looking at many, not only the role that women play as, um, 
and are so often seen as collateral damage or as victims, but what role women play in keeping life going, what role women are playing at the peace table. And as I said, we'll have a global perspective, so we'll be looking at, I'm sure we're going to look at Colombia because I want to do something in this hemisphere, and it's kind of unknown to people that there's more displaced people in Colombia than there are any place else outside of Sudan. Colombia is a terror zone. Right. Yeah. yeah, and um, we'll do something in Asia. We'll do. So I, I think that we have to do something in Afghanistan, and we'll do a story in Africa. So, um, and we'll look at how things are related. Also, we'll really track how um, the absolute proliferation of weapons in this world is contributing to all of this. Yeah, well, the, the, uh, the second piece uh, that I was thinking about um, is that when uh, at the, at the peace talks. The discussion or the, the, uh, um, the context is made that it is um, bad luck or against God to see your mother naked. Mm -hmm. So that's a cultural thing. Um, so one of, the, one of the power tools that these women had at that moment when they were about to be arrested and pulled out of the peace talks, which then became the turning point, mm -hmm. was uh, the threat to undress. Mm -hmm. And that stopped them from, from being arrested. Do you think that that worked in that culture and it might not work in other parts of the world? No, I think it would work in every single part of the world because I think what the women did first is they got women from both sides. So that Taylor's, Taylor's aunt could have been in that room and could have been threatening to undress. I think if, you know, if Barbara Bush or, or Lauren Bush or Michelle Obama would not have been successful had they not done, you know, had they not done it with all eyes in the world on them. And I, I think that we could do the same thing here. But I think that they really banded together. I, I think it's not as cultural. I think it wouldn't work anywhere. Myself. In um, the but New thanks York... All, but I just want to say thank you yeah. for the plug for WNDC. <laughs> for, oh. for getting people to come to our website and... and oh, yeah. <laughs> it's really important. I think the, the idea of having a series, Women, War, and Peace, is it's long overdue, and I think we, I, I, the thing that's exciting, I think, about this film is, I don't know for myself, is that it, it speaks to, it, it reminds us of the power that we hold, and that in doing nothing, what it is that we are participating in. And all of the even small work that was done, I mean, there were women at every level on this, including this great strategic thinking. I mean, it was just phenomenal. It was really wonderful. On, uh, in October, on October 6th, the New York Times had a front page um, that said, in a guinea seized by violence, women are prey. And it's the first time in my memory, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that I've seen an acknowledgement in the press of the toll that a war-torn situation is taking on women and that it's really front and center in the horror that women confront. I've heard it said that it is more dangerous to be a woman than it is to be a soldier in many countries. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, war has changed so in the last, I think, really uh, over the last century, but really in the last 20 years. And so civilians are the target. And women and children are the majority of the population. And, um, and, and we're targeted not just to kill, but in order to control a population. I mean, as someone said to me about the Congo, it didn't take a gender analyst to understand that if you rape a woman in front of her village, you control the village because you've emasculated the men, you've terrorized everybody, and you control it. So if you're trying to extract the wealth of the country and you need people to work, it's a, it's a it's good way one. to do it. Um, so I think that we're seeing that in a lot of places. Do you think the fact that the Times had this front and center on the front page means, or am I being optimistic, that there is maybe a global consciousness of that opening the possibility for our cry? for a stop against the atrocities uh, that, that are... I do think that there's a momentum for it. Yes, I very strongly feel that there's a momentum for that. Well, that's the good news. Um, I'd like to... We have two microphones, and we have uh, 15, 10, 15 minutes. Um, are there some questions for Ginny or statements? Yes, please. Deborah, hi. Hello. Oh, just take the mic, please. It's not on. We have to turn the mic on. Oh, you have to... Keep the th yeah. No, let's turn it on. Let's leave it on so we don't.
Turn no. it off. No. There you go. There, oh, you, there go. you are. Okay. Um, I confess to knowing next to nothing about Liberia. So where does um, the new president, uh, Ms. Johnson, Mrs. Johnson, how does she relate to the women in that community? Did she have any involvement? Did she come from somewhere else? Was there a, a relationship between them before, during the war? There was no relationship between them during the war. Actually, um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf has had a long political history in Liberia, but at that point she, um, she was living in exile outside the country. Um, and so she didn't really know about the women's movement um, and what, ha what was happening. I mean, she was um, a delegate uh, uh, representing civil society at the peace talks, so she certainly knew about them taking over the peace hall. And then the process that was after the war, when the, when the whole period of election, I mean, that period was a two and a half year transitional uh, period to justice. That was a, I think the first round of, of elections, there was 33 people who were running for president. And so it got down to, the election got down to a runoff between Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and George Weah, who is a very famous and beloved soccer player. And it was, you know, if the women had any doubt about who they were going to support, at that point it became very clear to them that they wanted to make sure that a woman got elected. And, you know, um, she had worked for the World Bank. She's a very established, you know, very bright woman who really, they felt really knew how to run the country. And so it was during that period that the women in Elm became much closer together. But it also looked like there was a lot of grassroots educating about the voting process. And how, is that part of how it was rested assured that there was in fact a democratic process going yes. on? Yes. I mean, and I who think, was watching the polls? Well, I, I think that, I mean, it's, that's true. And I think it's one of the things that's very interesting is that there had been, I think in 14 years, there had been as many different broken peace treaties. And, um, in Liberia, and one of the things that the women did was they got um, the benchmarks from the peace talk, from the treaty, and they made sure they really held everybody's feet to the fire. So if at a certain day in a certain community disarmament was supposed to happen, they made sure that it happened. If a voting thing was supposed to happen, the women made sure that it was that it was happening. They relieved the market women. Um, from their stance so the market women could go to vote. They made sure that everybody had their voting cards. They, you know, they might have made sure that their husbands couldn't get out of the house if they didn't want to vote for Ellen. I mean, I think they did whatever they could to make sure that she was elected. So in addition to Les Estrada at, 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 in, in, in work, at work right here, we also had major, major um, voting education going on. Right, and again, uh, I think this is something that- We need that more in this country. I think this is also something that UNIFEM was very, very involved in. Yes, are there other questions? Yes, please, over here. Hello, Linda. I just want to thank you very, very much because this was so very exciting. And before coming here, I thought, can women really counterattack the guns? And can women really make a difference? And I've been in so many marches where we haven't made a, di a difference. We've had 100,000 people at a march, an anti-war march, and we weren't really able to make a difference. Are you inspired to, <laughs> to work in this country too? Yeah. I, I, and what is the difference? Why can't we do it here? You know, I, I, I'm de definitely inspired to work in this country, and I would also say that one of the most inspiring screenings that I've done of this film um, was about a month ago in Philadelphia with a group called Mothers in Charge, and it was uh, for these, it was a group that was for um, started by mothers whose children had been murdered um, in Philadelphia, and by again, there's just such a proliferation of weapons. And there was the screening, there was 400 people at the screening. There was men and women. They made sure that there was both Muslim and Christians represented. It was amazing screening where at the end of it, everybody stood up and took a pledge, what they were personally going to do to end violence in their community, what they were going to do to end the guns in their community. These women had closed, there was a gun store in Philadelphia where most of the weapons uh, that, were, that were being retrieved around the crimes were coming from because someone was so loose with the paperwork. So I mean, I I was inc I was like bowled away by these women, and I would so I'd love to work with them here. I think that that you know what what the women in Liberia had and what these women in Philadelphia it's like it's not about somebody else. It's really about 
that us, and I think that that's what, what was really recognized, and, and the fact that people of really different walks of life were coming together. So I definitely am inspired to work here, and I, you know, definitely, and I think we can do things. In Liberia, thank you, Linda, in Liberia and in other countries, oh, who is, where are the guns coming from, and why are they so cheap, and why is there such easy access? I mean, I think that the guns are pretty easy to get everywhere, and the, the, the five biggest gun manufacturers... these are major guns we're looking at Well, they're at RPGs, they're, they're light, they're like... actually, they're light, they're light weapons, and they're, they're made in the Soviet Union, I mean, the Russia, the United States, France, the, the, the five biggest members, the five... Who's trafficking them? Well, I think several things are happening. One is that, you know, there's a, a, there's the arms traffickers that were used to run proxy wars to the United States and the Soviet Union, and they've yeah. gone rogue, so to speak. And people like Victor Bout, um, who's now been captured, and executive decisions that came out of South Africa, there was this whole apparatus that used to keep that going. And they, they still had the planes, they still had the guns, and um, they're, they're arms trafficking. And that's one of the things we're going to track, and in, in, we're going to follow also the implications of that on women. We'll follow that as part of the Women, War, and Peace series. Ah, wonderful. So you're going to take a thread throughout yes. the four. Is this film going to be included as one of the four? No, it's a fifth. It will be five so hours altogether. It will be a separate film, yeah. Oh. Are you going to be on target with starting in January? We're what starting in January. Yeah, you are yeah, starting yeah, in January. Yeah. Wonderful. Are there other? Yes. There are, there are two, three questions. Yeah. No. Well, wherever you are, <laughs> we'll catch everybody. We have time. It's the second time I've seen this film, and it's still just as empowering, so thank you. Um, I, I recently, a few months ago, I know the New York Times had an article about how sexual violence against women in Liberia is still so extraordinarily pervasive because not just through the last war, but through generations of wars, all that they know. Do you see opportunities for the women for this movement to confront that culture moving forward? I think that they are trying to confront that, and you're right that, that the, um, there's actually been an increase in rape since the war ended, and I think that that's actually something that... There's been an increase in rape since the war ended. Uh, and I think that this is something that's being seen in a lot of post-conflict societies, like the, the men come home, they have nothing, that there's 80% unemployment rate in Liberia. Um, as you said, that the violence is something that people have known for a long time. Also, I understand from... Um, Leslie, that, that there's a market women who are trading on the borders and they're being raped at the borders. Um, it's a huge problem and not a very functioning judicial system. So um, people are working to, to address that problem, but it is definitely a huge problem. This is something that we, we're seeing here more and more, uh, the more people, women who come and speak, is the war that is being waged globally against women on so many different levels. Um, I have heard that there's more women, there are more women being trafficked than arms. Mm. There are, as we know, a um, multitude of, of rape camps around. Mm. What happens to a culture, what happens to a country, what happens to a world where this kind of trauma has gone on, not only for women and daughters, but then for sons who are raised up with that, and how do we begin to break these cycles? I pose that as a very big question. I don't expect that Ginny is okay. going to answer that <laughs> in the next five minutes. Uh, there's a, there was another question in, in the back. Somebody else had their hands up. There's one right here in the front, and somebody else had their hand up in the back. Yeah. Thank you for a most moving and powerful film. I was especially struck by a point made by one of the women at the end about peace as a process and the meaning of reconciliation in that process. Uh, I'm sort of wondering where I am with that now, given the information we've just had about the, in the increase of rapes since the end of this conflict. But uh, it strikes me that that, is, that reconciliation is such a necessary element in thinking about peace, uh, certainly so absent from the processes that are in motion now in this country, for example, uh, with the prospect of the trials that will be held in Manhattan for the 
de some of the de detainees at Guantanamo. And uh, to contrast that prospect with uh, the idea of reconciliation, it seems like such a huge uh, gap. I wonder what your thoughts are on the significance of a reconciliation process in the longer process of peace. I think the concept that, that peace is a process, not an event, when, when I heard Sugar say that, when, I was like, wow, that's such an interesting concept that I had never thought about it. And to me, not only as part of the end, but as part of the beginning, like we can jump in any time and start, and start working for peace. Um, and I think reconciliation must be all, you know, I, I think it must always be very difficult for people who, I think, and I think that people in Liberia, women in Liberia are divided about it, um, as you saw in the film. Um, and yet, in order for, the, for Liberia to move forward, they have to reconcile. I mean, I, I think that it's kind of like in, after, you know, Hitler, I don't think that there was a lot of Jews left in Germany, but I think that's like in what's happening in, in Liberia is they all have to live together and move forward, and that must be incredibly difficult. Um, in terms of the World Trade Center and the, the bombing and the trial, I don't know. That's like, I haven't thought about all that in that context at all. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. I wanted to ask you about balancing your communication strategy. I know it's very important to have success stories that come out of these places. Um, and then at the same time, there's the danger of living by these positive anecdotes that you know sometimes might leave an audience thinking that things are fine now. And I was wondering, when you're going through your process of creating this storyline or any other, how you try to think about both sides and balance your message to make sure that people are left empowered yet with honesty at the same time? Um, well, I think that I, I guess I probably made that decision about what stories I tell. Because um, I, I think if it's just horror, 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 horror. I think it's just, what's the point? It just, it's, it's, it demobilizes you. It's, and I can't think of any point to tell that story. Um, so I was more attracted to this story because it had some hope in it, um, a lot of hope in it. And I think in general, um, you know, I, I, I believe in redemption, and I believe, I believe that, in, in an, and I like narrative really a lot, I like stories, and so I, I'm always more interested in telling stories that have some glimmer there for us. Um, I just, to me, it seems to me that, that the rest of the press is, or there's so much of negative around us, that it's, for me to do a positive story is enough balance, if you ask me. Is there a last question? Yes, in the back. And thank you so much, as everybody else has said. Um, I was just wondering, at, towards the end of the film, the, the women were very critical of the, the actions, or rather inactions, of the UN. Um, but you then spoke about some of the things that, that UNIFEM did in terms of, of democratizing the process. Um, I was just curious to hear your sense of the role of the international community in this whole story. I think it's been mixed. Um, but I think that the UN peacekeeping force has done a fabulous job. I think that, that without the UN peacekeeping force there for the, number, the length of time and, uh, that they've been there, it would have been a disaster. And I think everybody in Liberia feels that way. Uh, they've done, I think, a great job. Um, I think that during the war, you know, a lot of people felt like they wished that the international forces had stepped in sooner. Um, I, but I do also think that the U.S. the um, we, the U.S. the ambassador there kept the embassy open. He didn't have to, but he did. He chose to. He gave people refuge. He was very involved in some of the local negotiations with people to put their guns down. So I think it was um, uh, a mixed bag. But I, I wouldn't. Have, and that day where the, where uh, communications broke down and, and fighting broke out. You know, I've talked to the people who were involved in the UN in planning that day. They agreed that they made major mistakes. They then began to work with the women. Um, so I, I, I don't think that it's been without problems, but I think on, on the whole it's been very good. Jenny, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for a wonderful film, for coming here thank today you. and thank being you. with us. It's just <laughs> thank fabulous. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, yeah, thank you.
When one sees this film and when I hear women in this country talking about a post-feminist era, I think that even talking about a post-feminist era uh, is embarrassing. <laughs> Um, I would like to, to thank Tracy, actually, who's an intern here with the Department of Education. She has single-handedly, along with a wonderful staff, but gotten us up on the stage today because a lot of people were out. So I want to thank you very much, Tracy. And, and Unifem, where is Leslie? Leslie, thank you so much. And thank you for distributing and thank you for everything that you're doing and have been doing for so many years. I think one of the things that we're hearing here is constancy, that without diligence and without constancy, uh, we can't make strides. So I thank you for continuing with UNIFEM. And as you leave, um, you're going to be hearing a, a tape and there'll, there'll be a, and a visual, We Can Touch the Sun, which is this theme song for the U.S. National Committee for UNIFEM. I thank you all very much for coming. Stay dry. Have a happy holiday season and a happy new year. Thank you so much. <laughs>